Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Please rise for the arrival of the official party and remain standing for the invocation. Chaplain Monzon will now give the invocation. Let us pray. <laughs> Eternal Father, you are the giver of all knowledge. Throughout the last few months, these men and women have applied themselves to the art of learning. Today we are celebrating the achievement they have worked so hard to obtain. May they perform their job with the same dedication, perseverance, and joy by which they were, uh, they were able to succeed. Keep them safe as they perform their assigned duty, that they may be able to provide the basic need for their families. In a special way, I pray for you to bless their families wherever they are, that your presence may be felt in times of hardship and great happiness. I ask that you will keep them safe in their comings and goings. We invite you to be part of this ceremony uh, this morning. Thank you for being here and for hearing our prayer. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Chaps. Please be seated.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Naval Civil Engineer Corps Officer School, more commonly known as Seacoast. I'm Commander Amy Honick, and I will be your Master of Ceremonies this morning. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the graduation ceremony of Basic Class 275, and my distinct pleasure to introduce our Commanding Officer, Captain Peter Maculin. All right, good morning. How's everyone doing today? Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> They're just worried because they got to get out and start uh, earning their money now. So uh, good morning and welcome everyone to Morrell Hall, named after the father of the Seabees, Admiral Ben Morrell. It's home to several entities, but most prominent for this occasion, the Civil Engineer Corps Officer School, where the Navy's newest Civil Engineer Corps officers have trained for the last 15 weeks. I'd like to extend a welcome to friends and family of Basic Class 275, both here in person and those viewing us on DVIDs. We're happy you're able to join us for the graduation of the Navy's newest Civil Engineer Corps officers. I'd also like to take a moment to recognize our special guests. Thank you to Captain Kurgan, retired, for being our guest speaker this afternoon. We recognize how busy you are and the demands on your time. Thank you for taking the time to be a motivational and inspirational. That's, that's, that's a hint, motivational, inspirational. Uh, <laughs> uh, part of the culminating events for Basic Class 275. We have special, uh, other special guests today here in the audience, Naval Construction Group 1, NAFAC Engineering and Expeditionary Warfare Center, Naval Construction Training Center, Port Wyneme, Naval Mobile Construction Battalions 4 and 5, and Underwater Construction Team 2. Thank you also to Chaplain for the invocation. I'd be remiss if I did not thank and recognize the team responsible for executing the numerous parts of basic class training. The SECO staff, along with the extended staff, comprised of chiefs and officers for the Center for Seabees and Facilities Engineering, Naval Facilities Institute, Defense Acquisition University, and a handful of Marines from Navy Expeditionary Combat Command, corpsmen and Seabees from Naval Mobile Construction Battalion 5, from class administration to logistics, to teaching to the, from the podium, to the field exercise, to student advising, it's truly a team effort to graduate the class. Please join me in recognizing the professional cadre of leaders who served as advisors and mentors to the basic class. And my last word of thanks goes to our spouses. To all the spouses, thank you for your dedication and sacrifices for our Navy and for our nation. August 12, 1946, 15 students from Seacoast Basic Class 1 graduated from a 10-week course of instruction at Camp Perry, located in Williamsburg, Virginia. I invite you after the ceremony to look at Seacoast the early years and other historical displays inside our Seacoast lobby in the building behind me. Additionally, the CB Museum, located here at Port Wayneme, is full of rich Civil Engineer Corps and CB history. I highly encourage, if you have the time, to take a visit to the museum as often as you can throughout your careers to witness our heritage as CEC officers and CBs as we continue to make history. Today we will be adding 31 new Civil Engineer Corps officers to the prestigious list of Civil Engineer Corps officers who have graduated from Seacoast Basic Course over the last 77 years. Let me tell you a little bit more about Basic Class 275. So we have 31 new CEC officers four lieutenant junior grades, 27 ensigns, 18 officer candidate school graduates, three United States Naval Academy, two from the United States Merchant Marine Academy, four ROTC, and one Seaman to Admiral 21 program, and then three limited duty officers. Earlier in the training, we had one Republic of Korea Naval officer, Lieutenant Chung, who was not present, but he also participated in the majority of basic class 275 through our International Military Student Program. The degrees that the students hold. Engineers with the, with the following discipline. Aerospace, Civil and Structural, Construction, Electrical, Environmental, Marine, Ocean, Mechanical, and Nuclear. Eight officers had prior enlisted experience in the Armed Forces totaling 84 years of service. Duty stations. They'll be headed off to Naval Mobile Construction Battalions 1, 3, 5, 11, and 133. Amphibious Construction Battalion 1, Naval Medical Forces Pacific, and then Public Works Departments on Navy and Marine Corps and joint installations all around the world to include New Orleans, 
Pensacola, Marianas, Guam, Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, Hampton Roads, Kings Bay, Pax River, Camp Pendleton, Cherry Point, Camp Butler, Mayport, Washington, Newport, Point Loma, and Portsmouth. Over the last 15 weeks, this class is trained to prepare for service as CEC officers to include an introduction to war fighting, national defense strategy, and operational plans, an overview of the Civil Engineer Corps and Naval Facilities Engineering Systems Command, introductions to construction technology and project management, introductions to Naval Construction Force operations and a field training exercise, introduction to utilities, public works, and installations management, construction safety, and last, division officer leadership and career-focused curriculum that highlight the Navy Corps values and 10 signature behaviors of the 21st century sailor. To basic class 275, congratulations on your accomplishments this past 15 weeks and your acceptance into the Civil Engineer Corps family. In just about one hour, it'll be time for you to take your rightful place in the fleet in this great Navy of ours. Time for you to step up and be the Civil Engineer Corps officers the Navy needs so you'll be ready to fight the next high-end fight. Good luck to all of you, and the staff wishes you Godspeed. It's now my honor to introduce our guest speaker, Captain Chris Kurgan. He's had quite the impressive career over the years. He's got a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering, a Master's in Civil, went through executive training at the Kellogg School at Northwestern University, and he's a graduate of Basic Class 193. And just for the record, he was my adjutant when I was sitting over there. And we gave him quite the runaround. Also, the first class in this building. Yeah. <laughs> he served all over the world. He's had operational tours with Naval Mobile Construction Battalion 74. Four was the director of construction in Southeast Asia, first Naval Construction Division. His facility and staff tours include Naval Station Rota, Command Adjutant for Seacoast, uh, Roy Ventura County, Presidential Retreat, Camp David. NAFAC Europe, Africa and Southwest Asia, and NAFAC Pacific. He's also commanded at various echelons. He was the CEO of NMCB 133, was the Commodore of Naval Construction Group 1, was the CEO of Naval Facilities Engineering Command Northwest, and the CEO for Center for, for CBs and Facilities Engineering. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Captain Christopher Kurgan. Good morning. Thank you very much for the warm welcome. Is this on? Can you hear me? Commodores, Mass Chiefs, Wardroom Mess, Distinguished Guests, Legacy, uh, legacy CEC Officers, uh, and especially Basic Class 275, it is uh, my absolute honor to be here uh, with you this morning to, uh, to send you off, as the skipper says, to, uh, to earn your paycheck. Uh, but we're going to talk about this morning, it's a lot more than, uh, than earning your paycheck. I think, uh, I'm not quite sure how I got invited today. Normally this is an admiral, uh, an admiral in the community. They're all tied up, I think, in, uh, in a uh, conference this week. And so uh, I think the skipper was very brave in, in inviting me back. Uh, I know he spent a couple years here cleaning up after me. I, I went out of my way to make him nervous this morning. He said, hey, be here at 8.45 sharp. So, of course, I showed up at 8.53. <laughs> it's your last invite, don't worry. <laughs> he also got to the punch that he was a uh, basic student when I was the adjutant. And uh, I think Teresa wanted me to tell the story about how, how the basic class did he keg stands after they, uh, they, they broke into the Seacoast building to make sure that they finished off the beer that was left behind from a wardroom uh, wardroom chief mess get together. I'm not sure how there was any beer left over, so I'm not sure the story's true. <laughs> but uh, but yes, no, I, I do remember remember his basic class and, uh, and those that, uh, that I've had the opportunity to serve with, uh, both in this building and elsewhere. We'll touch on some of that. Uh, both uh, Ensign Morton and Ensign Sanius, uh, both legacy from our community. I've served with, uh, with their dads, with their uncles. I was relieved by, by uh, by Russ Sanius in, uh, in Thailand. And so that's it's an honor to be here today with you. And when I was talking with the skipper and asked him what, uh, what theme he wanted me to focus on today as, uh, as we honor, uh, honor this day, 
And he said, plain and simply, hey, I want to focus on family. We've been talking about family. And I think that that's a, uh, a fantastic topic. You'll see that weave throughout my, throughout my speech today. So this, this is really, this day is for you. It's for the, the families, the, the blood-related families, the mothers and the fathers. Um, it's for legacy, it's for our veterans, uh, and it's for our new Navy family. Because as they move on to their first jobs, they join our team, they join our community as CBs and Civil Engineer Corps officers, and they become part of our family. Out of, uh, just out of curiosity, how many, uh, how many here are veterans in the families that served? Okay, handful here. To the basic class, how many of you had a family member that was a veteran? Father, a mother, aunt, uncle, grandfather, cousin, that had an influence on you to serve? Okay, so those, those hands, if you can't see them, should tell you something. Less than 1% of this country serves in the, uh, in, the military, in the military. Of that 1% that serves, 80% are those sons, daughters, nephews and nieces of veterans. General, uh, General Leitch of the Air Force, he, uh, he wrote a book. The book's titled Skin in the Game, Poor Kids and Patriots. It's full of all the statistics, but the point is, is that's primarily who serves freedom within this country. We've had a, uh, an all-volunteer force now for 50 years. Less than 1% has protected freedom and democracy ac across the globe. And it's been from the same families over and over. I was lamenting when I was a Commodore, when I was in Commodore Mino's position, as we were going through uh, some of the... Uh, some of the statistics on the, uh, the health of the force, which are really kind of the impacts uh, and some of the destructive behavior, uh, the divorces, the, the, um, the drinking and driving, the, the drugs, the suicides, the domestic violence, all, all the bad things that come from, from stress and, and uh, suffering. And uh, I looked at one of the master chiefs and said, hey, doesn't quite seem fair. Seems like the same family's paying this too. <laughs> he looked me square in the eye. He said, sir, that's the way it's supposed to be. He said, maybe there's a warrior caste in this, in this country, and that's the caste that keeps freedom, freedom free. So I believe that to be true. I think the statistics prove that that's true. And so we appreciate, appreciate your service and you continuing to pay it forward. All of us veterans, all of us in the service, we're bound by the same thing. We're bound by an oath. We took an oath to support the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, to bear true faith and allegiance to the same. We finished that, we finished that oath the same way. So help me God. So we don't really talk too much about God anymore. So I'm going to make the skipper a little more nervous because I'm retired now. My freedom of speech, my, my First Amendment rights have been returned to me. And I'm going to exercise them. All right, so the title of my speech as I weave this through. Don't be a knucklehead. Be a leader. Be a warrior. Admiral Gregory, who uh, was a chief of civil engineers, she was first female chief. She was the first female in our community to be a commanding officer of battalion, to be a commodore of a regiment. She was battle-hardened. She used, to t she used to tell us all the time, don't be a knucklehead. Be a leader, be a warrior, They're, those are coming from me. But I think it's sound advice, because we were all young and invincible once, and, and even old and careless at times. And so uh, 
we'll, we, we'll weep her into the speech today. I said, I believe we live in, in, uh, in biblical times. The skipper talked about the next big fight. I think the axis of evil uh, we've been talking about for 10 to 15 years, we see it alive and well in the world today. And when I say the axis of evil, it starts with Russia, right? And the communism of Russia. We've seen the carnage there in Eastern Europe. It goes to North Korea, uh, which is really, it's been a, a cult that's existed far, long, far longer than it should. It's beyond my comprehension. It goes to Iran, which certainly facilitated and orchestrated the violence in the Middle East over the, coming, over the past month. And you can see us deploying and posturing our naval forces uh, back, back to the Middle East again for the third time in less than really 30 years. And then it goes to China. And China is the big fight. And China is the concern. And China wants to be the world dominant power. They desire to return to the old Silk Road and to be the global dominance. They want to be what America is on the communist front. So we see this fight building. We see this axis of evil building. Um, and it takes, it's going to take a hard fight. I believe it's going to take a much harder fight. And you guys will see that fight much harder than my generation. And unfortunately much harder, harder than the previous generations. Primarily because the world's changed and the lethality of our weapons have, uh, have changed beyond kind of the normal comprehension of... Uh, of the, of the average citizen or of the world. So point one. I got seven points. How many, uh, how many Naval Academy uh, grads do I have here? Okay, so uh, in 2021, Bishop Barron gave a speech at the Naval Academy and talked about God's, God in the Navy and God across Across the oceans, story of, of sailors. Uh, anyone go to that? Go to that speech? Oh, you all skipped it. All right, no problem. If you went, I was going to have you come up here and speak and save me the uh, save me the morning. So uh, the story of the Bible: God created created the earth in seven days. But if you go to the opening opening paragraphs of the Old Testament, the Spirit of God hovered over the primal nothingness, the chaos, and separated the land from the water. The Hebrew, the Hebrew interpretation was the tohubu, tohubu, tohubu bohava, excuse me, tohubu bohava, tohubu bohava. Thank you. Thanks, chaps. <laughs> the primal chaos. So God brought order out of chaos. So my first point to you is to be right with God. Right? You took an oath. You swore. So help me, God, be right with God. I will tell you in our business, our business is the war fighting business, and we may not have the luxury of tomorrow. Hopefully you find that lesson earlier than some. It's been said that there's no atheists on the battlefield. I believe that to be somewhat or mostly true. It's hard to tell in today's society. I will tell you that uh, on the 4th of September, 2004. It was a Sunday morning. It's about nine o'clock in the morning. We were uh, we were getting ready. We were building up to uh, execute the Battle of Fallujah. I was the S3 for the task force for NMCB4. It was, it was going to be the biggest fight uh, of the uh, of the Iraq campaign. Actually, it was the biggest fight since uh, Way City in Vietnam. And uh, on that morning, a 122 millimeter rocket impacted our camp, killed Petty Officer Eric Knott. So if you came in that main gate today off of, off of Venture, you came in not gate. It wounded Master Chief Marty Yingling, my S3 Charlie, and good buddy and good friend, Chief Williams and Petty Officer Sasser. What I would tell you is, while that caused pain and suffering, that certainly made me have a reflection on the lukewarmness of my relationship with God. 
my point to you is don't let that be something that makes you, uh, makes you refocus. You got to start to focus right now. If your relationship with right, is right with God, it makes it much easier to do our business. And I'll get, I'll get on that in a minute. But bottom line is evil works through fear. That's exactly what happens in terrorist attacks. They prey on fear. The enemy tries to prey on fear. The devil preys on fear. The answer to to fear is faith. If you have faith, you have nothing to fear. You have courage. If you have faith, you'll, you'll soon find courage. And I will tell you that that is liberating and that is free. Right? I've done uh, at least four combat deployments and, and many other, uh, many expeditions into the combat zone. And I assure you that's true. I'm going to give you some homework as I go through this, seven points, because we haven't given you enough already, right? We gave you a, we gave you a whole list of things that we just barely scratched the surface with. you got to, you got to go learn it all here in the coming years. Um, but what I will tell you is that uh, my words today will probably pale in comparison to anything that you pull out of that Bible. King David was a warrior, probably one of the best, a man of God. He wrote the Psalms. And there's a warrior psalm in those 150 psalms, and it's Psalm 91. I challenge you to memorize that psalm. If you memorize that psalm, I assure you it will come through in times of, of strife, in times of suffering. Don't be a knucklehead, be a leader, be a warrior. Point two, call your mother. The... Uh, the most requested, the most, the most uh, highly requested request of the dying on the battlefield is for their mother. Don't let it get to that point. Make sure you call your mother on a regular basis. I'm going to share your story. I was, uh, I was fortunate enough to, to, uh, to lead a group of Seabees and Marines for uh, SOPAC 93, doing disaster relief and humanitarian assistance after Cyclone Kim in the Pacific. And we were rebuilding schools and medical clinics throughout the islands to maintain our relationship with, uh, with those island governments. And uh, I, was on, uh, I was on my second stop. We had been in Fiji doing the same work for five months prior on the outer islands. And then I went to Tonga and I drank the water, didn't realize that, uh, that it was highly contaminated. And I got hepatitis A and I was sick. I was sicker than a dog. But I made a point to call my mother every Sunday. And, uh, and I went to the little coin machine on the island, and I put my, you know, forty dollars a quarters in, and I called my mother. And uh, midway through, I couldn't talk to her anymore. I had to start vomiting out the window, and uh, and I hung up the phone. And I said, "Hey, mom, I'm too sick. I got to go." And uh, you know, I didn't realize kind of the impact. So uh, I went, and I was sick uh, in my tent on the on the island, pretty much throwing up and controlling me for the next twelve hours or so. And uh, I show up at the project site the next morning. We're building a school. And uh, my AOIC senior chief, Clem, a hardened chief, hardened senior chief, leather face, he looks at me and says, Hey, LT, the parish priest just stopped by the project site and said, You need to call your mother. <laughs> of course, he did this in front of all the troops, right? So I'm giving your mom some ideas here, <laughs> just in case you don't call them on a regular basis. My mother, my mother somehow called the archdiocese of the, of the Navy, who got to the bishop's office, who called the, par who called the bishop's office in Tonga, who called the local parish priest, who sent, who came over to the project site to tell me to call my mother. So I'm giving them some resourceful thoughts, just in case you don't. The other way is just, just get the chief's phone number, and uh, I assure you, all you'll have to do is call once, and it'll never happen again. Dad's in the audience, don't worry, I'll get to you next. Don't be a knucklehead. Be a leader, be a warrior, point three. Grow in virtue. So I believe you, we continue to focus on character. It's one of the three pillars of, uh, of the development of our leaders. We do technical competence, we do character, and we do connections. I'm going to focus on character because you can't be a good leader. And folks don't want to don't want to follow you, quite frankly, unless you're a man or a woman of character. Free will is sacrosanct with God. 
That's freedom, right? We have the free choice to make a good decision or a bad decision. Certainly, we desire to make good decisions. We have choices. Those choices turn into actions. That action turns into a deed. That deed done repetitively over time becomes a habit. That habit becomes our character. And that character becomes our destiny, right? It determines whether we're able to fulfill that mission we came on, we were born into this earth to fulfill. I challenge you to study the virtues. We give you a good, good founding or a good foundation. Certainly the Navy has its core values, honor, courage, commitment. We have our core attributes. We have our 12 community virtues. I challenge you to live them through your actions and not words. They're not just slogans on a t-shirt or a sweatshirt, right? They're to be lived. And if they're lived, others will notice and others will follow your example. So be that example, be that light, be the example of virtue. Well before Christ, the, uh, the Greeks used to judge mankind by their, by their virtue. Virtue comes from the Latin ver to strength of man or strength of mankind, right? Once upon a time we judge someone by the strength of their character. That was Martin Luther King's dream, that's my dream. We still, haven't, we still have not achieved that dream in our society. We didn't even talk about virtue. So talk about it. Challenge yourself to grow in it. It is the objective of life. I'll note that Ben Franklin, when he was your age, had 13 virtues that he was going to chart his life by. He was a founding father of this nation. He was probably one of the most successful men in American history, an entrepreneur, a government leader, a diplomat. So set your course, determine how, how you're going to live your life. I'll tell you that I was here when we developed those 12 virtues for the community. There's two virtues that we missed. Because when we couched those virtues, we said, and we couched them across all the active duty uh, senior officers, the commanders, the captains, the, the senior chiefs, the master chiefs, all our senior enlisted. We did a massive survey. We asked, hey, what are the most important virtues to win this next fight? And that's how we came to those 12. There's two others that I challenge you with. The mother of all virtues is charity. All other virtues stem from that virtue. And humility. Humility is not necessarily something that, uh, that we have a lot of, especially as I look at that crew in the back and, uh, and I look in the mirror. Uh, but it is a critically important virtue because uh, pride is the most dangerous vice of all. And so I will tell you that most of the failures in leadership that I've witnessed during my time of folks that had to be relieved, or of senior officers or leaders, or my peers, they got hemmed up. Most of them were failures in, in humility and failures in pride. And I'll assure you, Commodore Mina will, will tell you the same. Title point four. Seek mentors of virtue. Don't be a knucklehead. Be a leader. Be a warrior. So don't seek a mentor because, hey, he's a truck guy and I'm a truck guy, so I'm going to choose him as my mentor. Choose someone who's going to challenge you to be a better person. So as I was sitting, I'm halfway through my speech, by the way, because I know I'm standing between you and your first job. My first job in the Navy was to join NMCB 74. We were in Desert Storm at the time. And, uh, you know, certainly that was the start of kind of the news. And, uh, and I was going right from here to Gulfport, Mississippi, so I could go through the, uh, the chemical chamber, learn how to wear the, uh, the chemical, biological, the radiological gear, qualify on my weapons, and then uh, go join the unit in Kuwait. And so uh, I went and I joined them, and uh, came back about, uh, about four months later in July, and uh, family came down, welcomed me, what I'll tell you is, uh, <coughs> one month later, I lost my dad at age 46. I am also a legacy. Five generations. Back to the Civil War. My daughter's sixth generation. I served this country. My dad served in the Army, Combat Engineer Battalion, uh, 20th Combat Engineer Battalion. He was a combat engineer. He served in the Central Highlands in Pleiku. 
And so uh, I grew up. I uh, he told me he told us some of the stories, but he would tell them as, as a kid, right? And uh, I missed the opportunity. <laughs> Sorry, I missed the opportunity to ask him any questions. I would love to ask him, both in leadership, in war, and in my family. My point to you is don't miss the opportunity, right? Your parents are probably smarter than you give them credit for, especially for those who are those veterans. Ask your dad those hard questions now. I'm sure he'll give you, he'll give you an adult answer because you're ready for adult answers at this point. Goes with, your, uh, goes with your grandfather, your uncle, whoever encouraged you to join this service, whoever those mentors are within your family, don't miss the opportunity. I assure you, if you're here and they, and they influenced you, they are men of virtue. So don't, uh, don't miss the opportunity. Title point five. Don't be a knucklehead, be a leader, be a warrior. Lead with passion. So when I was here at Seacoast, I used to bring the, a Marine Corps general in to give the Marine Corps General's perspective of leadership to all the new, new 06s in DC. General Kaufman at the time was at the Pentagon uh, and he was kind of the, the, the Marine Corps liaison with the Navy. He was a helicopter pilot, graduated from Duke. He got shot in the face during OIF. So his, his face is half missing. He's a big scary dude and he gives, he gives the point to the 06s to lead with passion. And of course, he gives the point, not how we expect it, right? Because when we say, follow your passion, that, that's, all, that's all been kind of bastardized at this point by society. I was, uh, I was here at Seacoast, and I was in Terminal 5 going to visit Fort Leonard Wood, and I see this 30, 30 foot by 30 foot digital display in, in Terminal 5, and it says, follow your feelings. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, God help us, Right? We say follow our passion. When I say follow, or I say we lead with passion, the word passion stems from the word from the Latin verb passio. And the Latin word passio means to suffer, to suffer for love of the other. That's what passion means. It means to lead with love, love to the point of willing the, will, the good of the other to the point that it hurts. Right? I will assure you that the best leaders over time the best leaders in this community, they lead with passion, they lead with love. And they suffer and sacrifice for love of the other. They put the community, they put the nation, they put others, their families included, before themselves. They are always last. So I challenge you to always be last. I challenge you to lead with, with passion. We've created a society where we, uh, for whatever reason, we try to avoid suffering. I've done the same. I've protected my children from it to some degree. I reflect on that, and I, I view that as a mistake. I believe that it's, uh, I've, I've grown in virtue on the occasions that I've been challenged and I've suffered the most. I thank God for those opportunities to suffer. It's also good to learn how to suffer. So if you haven't run a marathon, go, run, go challenge yourself to run a marathon. Because a marathon is all about challenging yourself to see whether you can suffer through the pain, especially for those last seven to ten miles. If you fast, try fasting for a day or two, right? Just to show your, your stomach that who's in control. I assure you it won't hurt you, right? It's just an exercise in virtue and temperance. But learn how to suffer and learn how to suffer well. That doesn't mean put on a sad face, it just means suffer joyfully. Suck. My mom used to say, suck it up. I hated it back then, but I understand what she means now. We say, suck it up CB all the time. That's what suck it up CB means. Lead with love. Title point six. Title point six, don't be a knuckle, knucklehead. Be a leader. Be a warrior. Have a plan. You, we, we made you do a professional plan in case you say 20 years, right? Yes? We still do that, Skipper? Of course we do. 
all right? My challenge to you is have a family plan, right? Have a family plan where you want your family to be in 20 years. Your family's more important for you than your profession. Lead them first. Fight for them. There'll be times where you won't be able to be there for your family because our nation will demand it. I was, I was fighting the Battle of Fallujah with the team when my youngest daughter was born here at St. John's Hospital. She was, born in, she was born in the janitor's closet because they didn't have any more room in the maternity ward. And so they, they moved some, uh, some of the cleaning supplies away, rolled a gurney in there, and she was born in there. I met her when she was four months old. She never lets me forget it. But that was the demands of the country, the demands of the time. Have a plan where you want your family to be. It is the, uh, the foundation of society. As goes the family, as goes, as goes the society. So uh, let's focus on rebuilding the family and rebuilding our country. There'll be times when you think you have to miss events for your family. I challenge you to think twice if you have the opportunity. Don't miss those parent-teacher conferences. Don't miss those recitals. When I was at, uh, when I was at the, uh, the ops officer of NAFAC PAC, I was coming to take the Commodore's job, Commodore Mino's job over here at the group. Admiral Walsh was PAC fleet commander, and we were at a, uh, a function for the uh, Japanese Defense Force to celebrate the Emperor's birthday. And I see Admiral Walsh, and his change of command is is the next day, and he walks up to me. He looks at me, he tells me a story out of the blue. He says, you know, I've been, I've been going through Admiral Nimitz's memoirs in my, uh, in my quarters, and do you know what day Admiral Nimitz went to Hawaii to fight World War II? I said, Admiral, I have no idea, sir. He said, well, obviously, the Japanese attacked on December 7th, and Admiral Nimitz arrived in Hawaii on the 24th of December. You know why Admiral Nimitz arrived in Hawaii on the 24th of December? To which he would not go back or leave the war, war once it started? He delayed his trip to fight the fight because his youngest daughter had a Christmas recital that he didn't want to miss. So I assure you the skipper's not going to let you join deployment late. But my point is, you know, as FEX workups and other things are occurring, you know, make sure that uh, you focus on the true priorities in life. But more importantly, I challenge you to focus on your troops and those important events in their lives. Because I assure you what happens is anytime we got something going on, we go to, those, we go to those, the, our stable and uh, we find out that horse that works the hardest out never lets us down and we challenge them all the time and we burn them out over time. Right? I see Master Chief saying, shaking his head up and down. That is true. Don't let that happen. Our business has developed future leaders. Somebody has to step up if that first class or that chief is, is gone for a day or for a few hours. Let it be. That's how they learn, right? And so I challenge you to, uh, to keep it all in context and perspective. The times that you can be there for your family, the times you can make sure your troops are there for their families, by God, please do so. Okay, I'm to the last one. I'm on my seventh. Because if God created the earth in seven days, I figure I better, I better wrap my points up with you on seven. Anyone know why God rested on the seventh day? God rested on the seventh day because on the sixth day, God created the United States Navy Chief Petty Officer. <laughs> Thus God could rest. I say the best advice that I can give you to grow as a leader and to grow as a warrior is to seek out those chiefs. I, uh, like I said, I was, I, my, uh, my first assignment, I was, I was checking into 74 in Desert Storm. I show up in, uh, in Riyadh Airfield in Saudi Arabia 
and I'm looking around for any CV. I'm looking around for any Navy. I'm looking around for an MCB 74 and there's no one there. I'm like, whoa, this is, this is a little awkward. And uh, Marine Corps major, he takes pity on me. He sees me, he sees me walking around asking questions. He says, oh, let me, let me go find out where they're on the battle space. Finds out where they're on the battle space. He takes me over to my unit. The unit, uh, the jail that was supposed to pick me up, he, he apologizes profusely, of course. And Chief Warrant Officer 4 Half Kenny and Chief Warrant Officer 2 Anderson, they pull me under their wing and say, hey, Anson, come on, you're living with us in our tent. Right? And during that first tour, Chief Poole, Senior Chief Clemenson, Senior Chief Mitchell, Mass Chief Van Rokel, and a host of others took me under their wing and taught me how to be a leader and taught me how to be a warrior. <coughs> the only way I can repay that is to pay that forward and live up to their challenge, right? Live up to be that leader that they want to follow. If you look back there right now, go ahead, take a look. There's a whole bunch back there. They're all bad and battle hardened. How many deployments, Master Chief? No one? Twelve deployments. Pales in comparison to my six or seven. Master Chief Sainz, how many deployments? Fifteen deployments, right? Become, uh, leadership, become, leadership comes through experience. It comes through hard knocks. It comes through suffering. None know that better than our chief's mess. I will assure you that there is nothing more, paddle, more powerful on the battle space than a Navy CB mess and wardroom that acts in unity. It has each other's back. The power of that mess is unbelievable, right? It creates a bond of love and a brotherhood and sisterhood that quite frankly is stronger than our bloodline familiar brothers and sisters love in many cases. It's just because of the suffering and because of the opportunities that, uh, that we served in together for a noble cause, for freedom. We are, the last standing, we are the last standing defense of freedom in this world. Europe is gone. Their capability, they don't have it. They've shortchanged their defense for years. It falls to us, and it falls to Israel to some degree within the Middle East. But bottom line is, there's a tall order ahead, and it's going to require you and our mess working together. So as, this, as I wrap this up, I simply want to say thank you. I want to say thank you to all the families. It is a huge sacrifice sacrifice your sons and daughters to this nation. I want to thank you for taking the road less traveled, taking the hard road. Maybe it was to help with college. It was for me. I was four and out. You know, I figured I, it, was a, it was a family duty to do service. It certainly intrigued me, but, uh, you know, I was going to go out and chase a dollar after I left. I never quite figured out how to do that. 31 years later, I'm still trying to figure out how to do that. Right? What kept me in all those years is the camaraderie, the noble mission, the hard, the hard and the, the hard road less traveled. So I challenge you to take that hard road, to be men and women of virtue, to preserve our freedom, and to contribute to the legacy that those that went before, that's how we honor them, is by carrying on their mission. And so I thank you for taking that. I wish you Godspeed. I wish you God's blessings. I wish it on our CBs, on our community, and on our country. Thank you for the opportunity today. Godspeed. Thank you, Captain Kurgan. The Navy takes great pride in recognizing the outstanding performance of its personnel. In keeping with this tradition, we would like to recognize those students
who have displayed outstanding character and competence, as valued by their academic performance, leadership, physical fitness, personal initiative, and enthusiasm. These distinguished graduates represent the top 15% of their class. Captain Macklin will now join Captain Kurgan at the center of the stage to recognize and congratulate the honor graduate and distinguished graduates of basic class 275. <clears throat> the honor graduate receives a membership in the Society of American Military Engineers, a Seacoast coin, and a copy of Can Do, the story of builder fighter CBs in World War II, signed by Captain Kurgan. The honor graduate of basic class 275 is Ensign Daniel Ruggiero. The following officers are graduating with distinction. Each distinguished graduate receives a congratulatory letter and a Seacoast coin. The distinguished graduates are Lieutenant Junior Grade Dominic Pecanino, <laughs> Ensign Sean Colden, Ensign John Morton. <laughs> Ensign Ki Wong. Our next award not only recognizes an outstanding basic student, but also honors a very special member of the Seacoast family. Seacoast was fortunate to have an individual who dedicated her entire adult life to the faithful service of our country, our Navy, and in particular, our Seacoast students. Having stood the watch faithfully for nearly 45 years, she graduated literally thousands of CEC officers, including every current active duty and reserve Civil Engineer Corps Admiral. She is an American patriot of the highest order, and among the very few individuals who have officially been made an honorary CB. As a reflection of her enduring presence and enthusiasm, Seacoast has established the Commodore Hunt Commemorative Esprit de Corps Award. The narrative on the plaque reads, in recognition of those members of basic class past who personified the spirit of camaraderie and teamwork, demonstrated an infectious and unwavering positive attitude, and distinguished themselves through their personal energies in support of their class and shipmates. The student from each basic class who, be, who best meets these characteristics has their name inscribed on this plaque. It is our pleasure to announce the newest recipient of the Commodore Hunt Award, Ensign Sean Colden. Basic Class 275, it is now our pleasure to recognize your efforts and present your diplomas. Captain Kurgan and Captain Macklin will present the diplomas. Lieutenant Kwan, please prepare the class for graduation. Lieutenant Junior Grade, Bryant Chow, Nafak Marianas. Lieutenant J.G. Dominic Pecanino, Naval Medical Forces Pacific. <laughs> Lieutenant Junior Grade, Nicole Schiff, PWD Portsmouth.
Lieutenant Junior Grade Samuel Wirtz, PWD Point Loma. Ensign Jack Byersmith, NMCB 5. Ensign Christopher Bonham, PWD New Orleans. Ensign Charlotte Brockman, PWD, Pensacola. Ensign Connor Cantrell, NMCB 3. Ensign Sean Colden, NMCB 133. Ooh, uh, 133. <laughs> Ensign Justice Curley, PWD Guantanamo Bay. Ensign Herman Dunlop, NMCB 1. Ensign Kojo Egla, PWD, Hampton Roads. Ensign Timothy Finley, PWD, Kings Bay. Ensign Cynthia Godinez, NMCB 11. Ensign Joey Gold, NMCB 1. Right. Ensign Claire Holden, PWD Guantanamo Bay. Ensign Matthias Lane, NMCB 5. <laughs> Ensign Mercedes Lentz, PWD Pax River. <laughs> Ensign Kenneth Mora, FIAD Camp Pendleton. Ensign John Morton, NAFAC Marianas. <laughs> Ensign Christopher Mergia, Fiat 29 Palms. Ensign Daniel Ruggiero, PWD Guantanamo Bay. Ensign Ian Sanford, FIAD Cherry Point. Ensign Michael Sanius, FIAD Camp Butler. Ensign Nolan Sullivan, PWD Mayport. <laughs> Ensign 
Ensign Thu Tiu, Amphibious Construction Battalion 1. Ensign Wyman Tolbert, Amphibious Construction Battalion 1. Ensign Carly Vial, PWD Washington. Ensign Ki Wong, NMCB 1. Ensign Stephen Williams, PWD Newport. <laughs> Ensign Lawrence Yamomo, PWD Guam. Thank you, gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the benediction. Let us pray. Eternal Father, thank you for allowing us to recognize the achievements these groups have made. I ask that you will take everyone safely home. For those going to celebrate with friends and loved ones, I ask that you will provide sound judgment in the decisions that they will make. Thank you for being here with us. Amen. Please take your seats. Captain Kurgan, on behalf of the graduating class in Seacoast, thank you for your participation in today's ceremony. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us both in person and online to honor our graduates. Please make sure you welcome them into your commands and this amazing community we have in the Civil Engineer Corps. This concludes the broadcasted portion of our ceremony.